So if it's Doug and Susan, hopefully I'm the Susan part and he's the Doug part. Um, I'm not used to sitting down. I'm so short. Then I'm used to standing up and then making the joke that it doesn't matter if I sit down or stand up because I'm so short. It, I just, can you see me or? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, I put my slippers on to drive here because it took two and a half hours, and then I actually put my shoes on right there in the car, so I might as well. But Doug's really tall, so it doesn't really matter because he doesn't have to worry about that. Um, I thought I would, I, I'm a little nervous because uh, I haven't done uh, anything like this before. You know, the, con the confluence of art and story has been really fun to do, so... And I, I spoke earlier today, I spoke at 3 o'clock in Riverside um, at, a at the UC Riverside Library for their 3 millionth volume. So it's been a really interesting day about thinking about really all the different ways we've got art now. And, and I actually mentioned the KCT site. So uh, I thought I would start by introducing Zach, too. This is Zach Behrens. And he's our editor at KCT. And this came about in a really interesting way. Zach was teasing me because I always tease him. Uh, this is our first time meeting. So he, he heard um, about me because there aren't very many people that write about the Inland Empire. <laughs> We're way out here in Venice, which is like the place I always wanted to live when I went to USC. And I came from Riverside, and the first place I came was out into Venice. And my ex-husband called tonight, and he's like, are you going to go see the guy? And the guy to us means the guy on the roller skates with the turban who's been going. Yeah, iconic guy, I know. Well, so for, for two people from, River, from Riverside to go to Venice, I have a picture of us sitting on the hood of my mom's Granada and, and getting ready to go roller skate in Venice. Like that's what a big deal it was for us in, in 1979, 1980. Um, so I, I got this call and there, aren't anybody, there isn't anybody who really writes about the Inland Empire except for me. And I know I might be the only person who loves it in that particular way. So Zach was like, do you want to write something? And I actually told him I had to think about it. Because I did. I, I didn't want to just write the easy stuff, but I also didn't want to write anything that seemed too cheesy. And the first thing I asked Zach was, can I have Doug to do original you know, photography? And Zach was like, OK. Because the other things on the site, there are photos, but they're the, for the, the site, that, the part that we're doing, it's usually, wait, what do you always tell me this? Stop. Yeah, stock. That's how dumb I am. I was like, oh, that's such a cool picture. And Doug's like, yeah, it says Flickr. And I'm like, to me, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that, that it would look like this, though. It, was, it made me really happy. So I just I wanted to thank Zach for, for inviting me to do it because I called up Doug. And I'm like, you know what? Do you think you have time to do this? And the strange thing is, before we do the actual formal talk, I mean, I've, I've always been a novelist and an essayist. And I wished I were a photographer. And that's what I wrote for the thing I wrote. For. I, I wanted to be a photographer so bad when I was 16. And in my house, like, nobody had a camera. I, I mean, they, nobody had anything like that. So I borrowed a 9 millimeter camera from my Young Life Christian leader at the high school. And he said, you can have this for three days. And given the kind of kids he worked with, me and all the people I still hang out with now, I'm amazed he even lent it to me. Because he was just like, please don't lend it to. And then he gave the names of some of the people you're going to see in this piece. He's like, don't let A, B, C, and D touch it. And I'm not even going to tell you. They're all in there. Um, and you still don't want them touching your camera. So. I had it for three days, and I walked all around my neighborhood, and I took what I thought were amazing pictures. And you know, I took the film down to wherever we used to take film down to in 1976, and they were not amazing. But the idea behind them was cool, and that's what we've got here, is really. So Doug and I don't even always go out together, and that's why I think Doug can talk about this now. Sometimes we've gone out separately, and before you look at J-Dub, which is what we're going to talk about, and some other stuff. But yesterday we went out. I, I want to tell you what we're going to write about for this week. Because yesterday we went out to see my rock. So you know, you got the big LACMA rock, the one that got the ride and the really expensive one. Yeah, so there's the LACMA rock. And then there's what's known in my house as mom's stupid rock. And my stupid rock actually escaped the quarry where the LACMA rock was and went down the hill from the pick apart junkyard that we were hanging out at yesterday. Um, the LACMA rock seriously lived right next to the pick apart junkyard where we always get like car parts if someone steals the car and then we have to rebuild it. So 
we will, some of those guys that you're going to see, we will say to Uncle Trent, hey man, somebody stole the 57 Chevy and he's like, what do you need? We need a right passenger door and he's like, that means I have to go to pick apart. Next to pick apart is the LACMA Rocks home. And so yesterday, Doug and I went out and we took pictures of my stupid rock. So my rock lives amid abandoned couches and it has this beautiful snow on it, which is the inside stuffing of the abandoned couches that is now shredded and turned into, it's a really pretty snow, don't you think? It's and it's going to last right now, even though it was 90, it's still out there. Kind of mm -hmm. There's something that looks like a giant, see weird stuff is, and Doug's always like, why do you come out here? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Sometimes I take him to places that are a little scary, and I think the gym was going to be a little frightening for Doug because he doesn't like sports. So I'm going to hand this to, uh, to Doug now, and he's going to tell you what happened when we went to JDEM. Well, a little bit more about the rock. I don't know, it's really crazy to hold this and there's no amplification. You know, I mean, it really is great. It's like a virtual, I might as well be like, you know? A mime, yeah. <laughs> and there'll be these interjections on the other side, she or I, and it won't be picked up at all, you know? So this is kind of conceptual performance or something. Yeah. Okay. This just proves you're a bad mom. Yeah. But <laughs> so the dumb rock, just to finish with the dumb rock. The dumb rock is actually just a totally beautiful rock except for the entire side that's covered in graffiti, which is okay except that it's not really that great at graffiti. The couches are cool. It really is genuinely just around the corner from the quarry where Heiser's rock came from. So it is the same. My father's a geologist. And he really doesn't care about granitic rocks. He's, he likes sedimentary rocks. You know, you have to know geologists to, in fact, he, he picks vacation spots based on what the rocks are like. So Hawaii, he, he's not interested in volcanic rock at all. So Hawaii to him is a wasteland, you know? <laughs> but somewhere, you know, in Turkmenistan where they have like mud volcanoes, wow, you know, he's all over that. So it's pretty strange. The upshot was that after we went out and saw the Stringfellow acid pits, the pick apart, the rock and the couches and, and, and the couch stuffing rustling in the breeze, I phoned my dad up and said, you know, the Harupa Hills is what it's known as. Would you happen to know how old that is? And he, he knows one hell of a lot, especially about Southern California geology. So his first, the, the first answer is always, well, I'm really not the right person to talk to about that because it's not sedimentary, right? And then I have three pages of very fine notes about everything you'd want to know. Well, here's how they date those hills. There are zircon crystals that when they crystallize, freeze in uranium-267 isotopes, which then decay to lead at a 4.7 million, billion dollar, you know, billion year half-life. And so my guess would be that those hills or probably 105, that rock is 105 million years old. And at the end of all that, it's finally like, but you really should phone this other guy, Doug Morton, to really find out. So then I phone Doug Morton, and I don't say my dad says it's 105 million years old, I say, my dad says you're the guy to talk to, and these guys spend their lifetime, like artists, essentially doing something that almost no one pays any attention to. So if someone's interested in something they've done, it's like, I had to sit down, put my feet up, you know, Morton, here, let me, and I hear the computer going, I've got all this, you know, yeah, yeah, we had 18 zircon dates out of those hills there, and it's 108 million years old, right? So my dad was a bit off, but. <laughs> the funniest thing about yesterday was that nobody came to talk to us, and that I wanted to, on my two-hour journey here, I was realizing there was something weird about yesterday. Every other place we've gone, We've always run into a great story, and we always email Zach like, man, we got so lucky this time. Then the very next week, we're like, man, we got really lucky this time. And Zach's like, didn't you guys just say that? Every week. But this was the only time that no one came. In fact, it's kind of a, you don't really want to hang out there. You know, like, I mean, pick apart, yeah, but not, not by my stupid rock, because it's probably they're watching it going like, when they leave, we're going to go, because some of the graffiti is very specifically about bad drugs. But... I was just going to say that looking at all of, all of these, everywhere we went, 
Every other place, somebody told us a story. And so the, the one that's, it's hard to see, but there's the one where there's a guy walking, and that's at the end of this. That's my brother-in-law, although we couldn't identify him, because he is the night watchman, and he, he parks his truck at the Santa Ana River. We'll have some photos of that. Yeah, he parks, he parks his truck there. So Doug's first time meeting him, we were there for two hours. Yeah. Derek still had so many things to tell Doug. He called me the next day. He's like, yo, man, where's your friend? I'm like, uh, I think he's working. Is he coming by today? And everywhere we went for all of these places, we had someone tell us a story, except for yesterday, which was funny. Because instead we had the backstory. of it. Yeah, we had 108 million years of story. So anyway, we should. OK, just quickly about you know, you're here about photography, you're here about stories, I assume, or I, I'm not really even sure why you're here, but we'll try and be somewhat entertaining. But clearly, it's an interesting moment for photography because everyone is a photographer, you know? And a number of people here have said, oh, I'm an amateur, or whatever. Everyone's a photographer. And I think for photography, it's a fantastic moment. I mean, you know, if you're pretty cool, and then assemble something out of that, so it's like this meta photo what the photo image database world thinks shame is. You, you actually have a photograph of a concept like shame. That's pretty great. But part of what I think we're trying to do in some way is keep the stories and the narrative and the place and the things that people tell us and maybe Susan's individual voice connected to the sets of images. And that's what's really fun. And beyond that, I think both of us are just trying to figure out how do we lead our life in this world, you know? I mean, what, you gotta do something. So weirdly, every two weeks, we're like, oh no, Zach's expecting something, and somehow that structures our life in a weird sort of way. We better, you know, and then we go out and something strange and magic happens. I don't know, you wanna jump in on that? And then, no, well, you can listen to the stories. You, there's a phone number on all of these, and you can, yeah. And you can phone that local number and then punch in 119 pound and listen to the long version of all these stories. And that's then her. So you don't even have to be here to do it. You can look at KCT's side and then write down 119, listen to that story, and so on. So, and she's reading them. She's pretty good. I went to read them at a radio station, and it was fun. I used to read, I used, I used, to, I used to do essays for NPR for All Things Considered, but now they don't have very many commentaries anymore. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> it seems like a lot of politics and not quite so much weird stories. One of the, my favorite ones that I ever did for NPR was called Batmobile, and it was about me and my ex-husband buying our oldest daughter her first car. So it was about his first car, which was known as the Batmobile. And on our first date, I couldn't figure out why he wouldn't let me roll up the passenger side window, and it was because it had a bullet hole in it, and he had just gotten the blood stains out of the seat. And then his dad bought the car because the guy was dead. So anyway, <laughs> it was really romantic. <laughs> He's at my house right now fixing sprinklers in case the boy comes to ask Rosette to prom. He's well, he weighs 310 and he's a correctional officer. He looks like Shaquille O'Neal, but a little shorter. He's 6'4". So anyway, <laughs> the essay that I wrote for NPR was about us buying that car, and it was in the LA Times um, magazine as well. So when I went to record these, I realized how much I missed writing that size of story. And also that weird, quirky story that everybody's like, wait, <laughs> you still hang out with your ex-husband? Like, wait, I'm like, it's Riverside, man. <laughs> like, we really suck at divorce, because <laughs> we're just... <laughs> Yeah, well, like, we're, we all hang out. Everyone on my block hangs out with their exes because we're really poor and it just seems convenient, you know? And, and it just, <laughs> so it's just like, hey, I think you guys do it better in LA. But anyway, every, every time I looked at the images again, I remembered being out there. And so, yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to hear. Um, Every, every, the first two times, I went and I had a story, and then Doug went separately, like I said. And then, for example, for some of them, we just drove, and we, one of them, we were on our way to my grandma's house. My grandma's 95. She's the oldest living patient for Kaiser Permanente Healthcare. She used to be one of the first nurses for Kaiser. So when she goes to the hospital, all the other nurses go to her room and they're like, your Kaiser number is 662. And she's from Switzerland, so she's like, yes, it is. And then they're like, oh my God, you're still alive. That's always really fun. We're Kaiser, we haven't killed you. 
So, so my grandma was the only one that didn't like Doug or want to talk to him at all. She doesn't like anyone. No. She only likes her dog, and her dog died two years ago. So anyway, we were on our way to my grandma's house to try to, to see my grandma, which we did. We haven't written that one yet, because my grandma's really grumpy about it, and I don't want her to yell at me. Um, and on the way, we found the sheep. Because I kept telling Doug, when we drive down this road, we're going to see sheep. And Doug's like, why would we see sheep? Like, yeah. why would that be true? And I'm like, because this is where the sheep live on the way to my grandma's house. And I mean, I'm 51. So Doug's just like, really? OK. And then we turn on the corner. He's like, oh my god, there's sheep. And I'm like, I know. Let's go see them. So we went to see the sheep, and everyone just talked to us. Um, the weird part about doing it like that is that I do feel like we're really lucky. I feel like the shep the, you know, there are the shepherds talking to us or whoever. And then sometimes we go, um, like we went to the funeral that's in this one, we went to the wake and we don't talk to anyone. We're just, we're just, we were just there. And then other times just, it, it's just as the story falls into our laps and we didn't have the story, but we were driving down the road and there was the story. So the way we found my brother-in-law's story is that everyone kept saying, you need to go take him some food because he's there for 12 hours and it's nighttime and he's really hungry. And I'm like, where is he? And they're like, I don't know. He's over there at that park where we used to go. And I'm like, Anza Park? And they're like, yeah. He parks right next to that freaking marker. And I'm like, the marker where Anza crossed the river in 1772? Yeah, whatever. Go take him some food. And I thought, how cool is that? He's guarding a construction site right next to, and he really does. He has his truck parked five feet from the marker. And so all these strange people come up and tell him stories about Anza crossing the river. <laughs> He's sick. It's an amazingly historic place. Yeah. It's, it's And my, my brother-in-law is the, the, the baby brother, but he's 6'8 and goes about 380. So he's standing there next to the truck, and people are like, why are you here? He's just, just watching the crane. And then they're like, oh, and they're snowbirds. And they tell him about Anza. And it, it, it was, that was a great story, too. All right, well, we'll start with this. This is, this is not on the walls here. And this is the high school, North High School in Riverside, that Susan went to and all these other associates of Susan's. I am, you know, a determinedly anti-sports person, period. Except for the Dodgers, yeah. <laughs> and I, so she's like, we should really go and not so much the basketball game as the scene at the basketball game because there are generations of people who show up in this gym that is really like a shrine. I guess maybe we'll just hit the next slide. Yeah. Lights down or you can vote. Down. All right. We've got lights down. And the first thing that happens is, uh, yeah, it's pretty... It's pretty great. The place is packed, and everybody knows each other. Coming in, I got there early because I always get the places early. I'm a little paranoid, and everybody's giving each other hugs and high-fiving and looking at me really kind of weirdly because I'm like, I definitely do not fit in. <laughs> yeah, just at all. And all right, we'll hit, we'll hit a few more. So I'm doing my usual thing, which is to wander around. You know, a photographer's job is to hang out. It's just to hang around and like, that's the whole job right there. It's like, click, you know? I mean, that's really an embarrassing sort of situation. I don't know, you wanna jump in? And it turns out, you should definitely weigh in on this. Um, I told Doug we needed to go to this game because my kids go to the other high school. They go to the high school where, where Doug went, Riverside Poly. It's a great high school, but I went to North. And so the weird thing about this is that when I'm at Poly stuff, and my, I mean, I have a 22-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 16-year-old. So I've been going to Poly stuff for a long time now. And the moms will still be like, oh my God, what year did you graduate? And I'll say 78. And they'll say, but I didn't know you. And I'm like, that's because I went to North. They recoil from me as if they're slugs and I've poured salt on them, okay? Because, because. And sometimes I think that's really weird and sometimes I think it's really funny. Most of the time I think it's funny. But there's a way in a place like Riverside and in lots of places around California that it's a specific kind of town, right? And in your town you have this high school or that high school or you have people who left and people who stayed. And that's really what Doug and I talk about a lot is there's people who leave 
your hometown, and there's people who stay. And in the beginning, when Zach asked me to do this, I kept feeling bad that I've stayed. But North was like one of the main reasons that I still do live there. I go to every North game. My girls, North I, I almost wore it today, but I had to wear it to school because two of my students, they, they're Huskies. And everyone says, you know, it's a bad school. So we wear the t-shirts um, to class at UC Riverside because everybody makes fun of us and we think it's funny. The, the, the names on the, on the wall right here, it sounds crazy, but in California, for CIF sports, it's a huge deal to make it to the finals. And if you're from a neighborhood like mine, you don't have much else, right? You've got your sports. And people still talk about sports, and that's still their obsession. So on here, you have the names. D. Sims is over there, and that's my ex-husband. And during this year, I was actually keeping score because we met in the eighth grade. There's a wonderful yearbook so, photo of her, which is really the game, and in the background on the, uh, uh, I'm, on the yeah. sidelines, you can see. I'm keeping her, keeping I'm, score I'm keeping score. Game. So the thing is, the reason that I thought this would make a great story is that three, four generations of people still come to every game. And so when I walk in, there might be 400 people that I have to speak to during that evening. And I mean, if you don't speak to them, they'll be like, I saw you at the game, but you didn't speak. And it's somebody who you know, immigrated from Louisiana in 1952. It's Mr. Jones. And I have to go speak to Mr. Jones. And Mr. Jones has to ask me how my kids are. And that's how it was. And so I tried to explain that to Doug, but he didn't really understand until he got there. And then I want you to say how weird it was when you were in the <laughs> Yeah, run, run a few backwards. Run a few backwards. All right, so that's, yeah. Well, you're, you're, the X is in there, I think, before this one. Oh, oh no, wait. I, I missed a few. I missed a few. There he is. Oh, okay, so that's my ex husband. He, he doesn't look like a happy man. That's his happy look. <laughs> <laughs> the person on the right is Uncle Trent. That's <laughs> 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 you know, what, well, you know what's great is. Right, right, right. I, I have a long... Okay, I'm done now. They, they wanted a photo there. They set it up. They were not happy about it. And then, I, you know, usually, you know, photographers kind of work at a few different angles. They look exactly the same in every single one. Yeah. There's a whole long sequence of digital photos. You know, it's just like, yeah. yeah. These are who's at the house right now waiting for TJ to come ask that man's daughter to come. I'm so glad I'm not there. <laughs> in absentia. Um, the thing okay. is, Uncle Trent is part of the family. And yeah. However intimidating. Part of the family. And then there's a million other people. And why people laugh, like, why would they still care? This is a girls' basketball game because that's what you do. You, know, you want all of the people in your community to go to college. <laughs> A, phil a philosophical point about photography is, and, and really a difference with writing, because this is text and image, which is, which is interesting and I've been interested in for a really long time, some of my own stuff being text and image, is that you can't shoot an abstract person. You know, you can't, you can't shoot mankind. You can only shoot a person, right? And so you are, you are faced with those. You, in writing, yeah, you know, and, and so, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm not shooting. Because <laughs> Trent was supposed to be working at that same job site, and Trent wasn't there, and I said, I don't think it was a good night for you to meet Uncle Trent. So Doug, this is yeah. a Right, right. And you met him, and that's the happy look. Oh, but I love that, because then you're confronted with specificity. There is an ex a real, honest-to-God person there, and that's what I love. You know, she kept kind of warning me, oh, look out. Don't do something wrong. If you, if you do something wrong, which I don't even know what that means, it's very abstract, but they will remember, you know, and I heard that, a mantra, like, in fact, they, you were even saying that yesterday, yeah, they remember, you know, so, and I, apparently I haven't, but at that point, I'm like really intrigued, who are, you know, what, it, it's so, it's so wonderful, and then, I don't want to think all our stuff was scary. Was scary <laughs> no, it wasn't, okay, we should, yeah, we should go, we should go. But I love the scene, you know, it was so intense. It really was like one kind of gigantic intertwined bunch of humans. It was like a meta human in this group. And all of the people all know each other. They hang around, you know, there's a break in the middle, some kind of mystical thing about basketball having something like 
quarters or periods or no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting behind, I'm sitting in front of two men. One of them was my ex-husband's third grade teacher. He's 80 and he still comes to the games. And next to him was another teacher and they're both like, who's that guy down there? You know, they're like, who's that guy you were talking to? And I'm like, oh, that's Doug. You know, he's a photographer. And they're like, why is he taking pictures? And I say, oh, you know, he, we're doing a story. And they're like, okay. Completely after this, just like whatever. And then like, how are the girls? And how's this and how's that? And I was watching Doug. And what was amazing is he told me he doesn't like sports. He never ever, he, he said, I, I, I don't like going to high school. I never go back to poly. But watching Doug be under the basket, this is, this is the shot. This shot right here, Doug was under the basket. And this shot made everyone in the community so happy that I was so glad that we could talk about this tonight. Three passes to now for the <laughs> this is Simone, this is Simone Bacoud who's jumping. So her dad, Leonard, um, his, his mom and dad and his wife's mom and dad were born in New Orleans. And his, his wife's father, who shows up later, he had a, a, a furniture store in New Orleans and he was chased out. He was told, no, 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 your store is getting a little bit too big and you need to not be here. And he said, well, I'm going to move my store over here. And he was told, because he was black, no, no, no. And he was fifth generation New Orleans. So they came to LA and he had a huge furniture store here in West Los Angeles. And he sent his daughter, Nedra, to UCLA. And she's a small animal vet. She married Leonard, Coach Leonard, who's a truck driver. He grew up in Crenshaw. But they're both New Orleans people. So this is their daughter. And this is their daughter. She's five foot four. This is against Palisades High School, which isn't far from here. And the girl she's jumping past is six one, and the other girl is five nine. And Simone's five four. And so this this photo, but this photo made made everybody that, that was in that huge immediate family of mine, it made them so happy that this was documented, because this doesn't make it into the paper, because it's North High. And what they said to me when they saw Doug, that Doug doesn't know this, at first they said, is he taking pictures for the, and they, they named our local newspaper. And I said no, and they said good, because if that's what he's taking it for, they'll never make it in. Because there's this way that people in Riverside think that no one loves them, and that no one ever wants to hear anything good about them, and it's even more pronounced in, in my community. So what's interesting is they were like, Oh, he's taking pictures for something else. This was the most pop, Zach, no, this thing was like so popular. I don't even know how many people looked at it. Hundreds and hundreds of people. And it made everyone in the community so happy because, yeah. because not because Doug made them look good, but just because they existed. Do you know what I mean? Because they existed and, and, and somebody took notice of them. There she is again. Yeah, that's Simone. She scored 31 points. Um, and she basically won the game. And she's little, she's a junior. And so, yeah. Oh, okay, so there's Trent again. And then over there is George Sheranian in the glasses. Um, the guy in the blue shirt is, you don't wanna know about him. But anyway, so George Sheranian was the manager of our high school football team. So he's like that character in the movie that's not on the team, but he's the manager of the team. He's four years older than me. And he has three rings. I don't think you can see them. But you know, he has three CIF rings from when our football teams won in the 90s. He still is part of the team. He goes to every single sporting event. He's 54 and he brings his granddaughter now. She's five. So every football game, every basketball game, I always see George Sheranian. And um, his, his dad was from Armenia and they grew up a few blocks away from, from uh, where I live downtown. It's so wonderful to pay attention to something on the level that you can in this situation. You just immerse yourself. And then I have a guide. She knows everyone at these games. So I just play with the camera and do what I can. There's Joe, Susan, Cassie, there's Ray, yeah. Steve, I was <laughs> Simone again. And I just don't say those terrible things about the refs, because that is one thing. You know, I would not want to <laughs> And then if, it's, if, it's, if the calls start going well, he's like, I want some. <laughs> Which he shouldn't need any. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, you're missing a perfectly good game. There was a lot of. Three seconds. Three seconds. Three seconds. Because everyone has their thing. Dwayne's is three seconds. There's the key. She set up a tent. She blew the fire. Let's go. Like, it's just good luck forever. Oh. All right, so that's Coach Leonard. Yeah, that's the Dacoods. And that is Nedra's parents. That's the guy from New Orleans. You see his shoes? Those are like $300 shoes. And then he still wears his overalls just to let you know that he's playing with you. These shoes are fantastic because I was on the floor, you know, shooting those super low angle shots, and these incredible shoes went by, you yeah, know? I was like, what? yeah. Was like, <laughs> with the that's shoes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay, this is a whole this is a whole different story. I don't know. Are there questions about image and text? I mean, that's sort of the the, the story. Yeah. Did you make the shot? <laughs> Did you all make the shot? <laughs> yeah. No. They they. The, the team won, and they were so excited, like you said, to have the KCT piece. That this is actually something I thought would be funny to say. They made it I mean, to the state finals. Yeah, they made it to the they made it to the state finals, which is the first time in history that a girls basketball team, especially we, to play girls basketball you know, against I'm sorry, but against LA teams, LA private school teams, you know, everybody's like 6'1. Our tallest player is 5'10. All right? It's just we were just like a little way more about basketball than I know. But the thing was I had to tell Zach this. I tried to send the piece to Uncle Trent and everybody that's in the old neighborhood, and nobody had a computer. And like the times are really bad right now. So a bunch of people had computers, but when they broke, nobody's been able to replace them. My across the street neighbor is the same way. She hasn't had a computer for ages. So anyway, they couldn't figure out how they were going to see it. And um, of course, the kids all just had it on their iPhone. But by then, everybody in the neighborhood had been drinking that night. So there were 30 guys in the driveway, and they're like, we can't find your story. We can't find your story. And I said, K-C-T-J-Dub. And they're like, OK, we have to go borrow a computer. Took them an hour to find a computer. Then they came back, and they had to figure out how to get Wi-Fi. That was another hour, OK? So two hours later, I called them, and they're like, we've got it. We've got it. But by then, everybody was a little inebriated. It was hilarious hearing their comments about the story. They, Oh, it was crazy. They won. They went to the state state finals. They rode all the way up to Sacramento, and they lost by two points to the Northern California team. But this story made it was a huge deal to me. It was one of the happiest things I think that's ever happened to the East Side. Um, and it was a big it was a big deal that the photos were so beautiful. You know what I mean? That Simone was leaping like that, and there was that one photo too of the crowd. So those are Calhouns. I went to school with a Calhoun. There were 10 Calhouns, and then each of the Calhouns married people, and then all the Calhouns I went to school with each had six kids. So there's always a Calhoun on every basketball team. There was an entire bleacher full of Calhouns. The Calhouns, you said this section. Yeah. So if you go on the website and you look, it'll say Calhouns. I just wanted you to know Doug did a really good job because I was like, should we have them all stand? Oh, wait, they're all standing. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's a good question. How do you how do you make a selection of, of photos and text? My rule is that, and, it, and it's a little it's a little dicey because we're doing this in parallel and usually in a panic. Going Zach, even though he's really nice, we feel threatened by the deadline. So, yeah, what are you talking about? Don't worry, get it to me. It's no no problem. But my rule generally is if it's in the text. I don't really want a photo of it, you know? I mean, if, it, if the photo is something independent and is informed by the text, or the photo adds something to the text, there's, a, there's kind of an interaction there, then that's what I like. I mean, I'm more interested in, truthfully, the space between the text and the photo that's an independent thing. Where, if, you know, if you look at the photo and then you listen to the story, then you look back at the photo, and it's a different photo. I mean, they should somehow ricochet. They should not overlap. You know what I'm saying? And so that's a weird criteria. I mean, that has less to do with the quality of the photo than, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's odd, but I, I kind of like my system has slowly evolved. That's a great question. I don't know. 
that's odd, an odd thing, but. Yeah, usually it, I'm writing the thing, and then Doug sends me <laughs> four or five photos that he's chosen. Yeah. I'm already, usually I've already written it, so I have no idea what. But then she'll say, hey, how about this, or how about that, or something, or I'll knock one out because it's already in there, or something like that. It's definitely evolutionary. And it's You know, two or three photos, and he'll post we, anything we send him. That's what he says. Like ten. We had a lot of great photos for the geometry of the winter desert, and I think we had six photos for that one. But I mean, that's just really what the piece needed. And also, most posts for me, this has been really intimidating. Most of the time, people are writing what four or five hundred words. You know, for a post, that's about, I guess, what everybody says they're, um... Well, they're only reading the first four or five hundred a year, yeah, so... Yeah, well, <laughs> they're, they're... I think the attention span is supposed to be four to five hundred words. And sometimes I've sent Zach, you know, nine hundred words, or sometimes I've sent... I think a couple times I sent, like, twelve hundred words. And we tried to cut them down, but... It's hard for me as a novelist and an essayist to write something that's five hundred words. So in the beginning, what was it, Zach? You said I could write every week, but it would be like 600 words or 500 words. And I was like, no, nah, I... yeah. And I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. That's like one paragraph. That's not happening. So I told him I want to do it every two weeks, but I want to write something about a thousand words. Um, when you're when you're looking to me at the text and the photos together, I like the way they're broken up. I like the way, and I like um, Ed Fuentes and Nathan Masters. They have historical. They, they do a lot of great pieces on the KCET website, and they have all these great historical photos. Sometimes what I really like is looking at ours, and then looking at the historical ones, and just seeing the, just the beauty of the different kinds of photography. D working with Doug has been really interesting because I confess the thing about wanting to be a photographer, but also, this is what I talked about today, is I always read books of photography, that's what I read. I use photography when I'm writing my novels, and I always have recommended it to my students, long before Doug and I started working on this project. The only thing I can read when I'm working on, on certain parts of my novels are books of photography. So next to my desk I have, I never know how to say that name, Mariana Yem, Yempolsky? Yeah. She's a photographer from Oaxaca. I have old Eudora Welty. I have um, the WPA photos, you know, whole series of WAP, WPA photos. And then Robert Adams was this huge deal to me. And so um, looking at black and white photography has been really something. The, the way I met Doug was through his book Dream Street. And then I asked him to come take pictures of me in the, in the Santa Ana River bottom. And that was for a story that I was doing for the Huntington magazine, Huntington Frontiers. Because in my novel, I had this character that's obsessed with travel and with art. And I was writing about John Constable's huge six foot landscapes. So Doug shows up, it's our first time ever working together. And I just asked him and he did it as a favor. And I have my dog and we go in the river and we're walking down the river bottom. And Doug's taking pictures. And it's just, it looks like a constable landscape. It's my, yeah, if you don't, yeah, and if you do, if, if you're like, what the heck is constable? It's those big, huge six foot landscapes. John Constable always painted his same little river. It's called the River Stour or Stour, S-T-O-U-R. I never know how to say it. It's not like I talk about it at home. At home, it's just like. Let's watch the Lakers. So uh, uh, the, the constable paintings, he was obsessive about this same landscape. So it went back to that whole home and away. And that's why um, it was interesting to have Doug. The Santa Ana River is not anybody's you know, famous river by any stretch. And um, so I love my river. And it's a wild river. And there's actually a lot of coyotes there, nothing but homeless people and coyotes and snakes. And, and it's still my river. So that was the beginning of our working together, wasn't it? Yeah. What's this story? Oh, that's the Santa Ana River. Yeah, yeah, we can jump into it. But one quick rant here, one real quick rant. And so I don't know how many photo, are you, a lot of photo people here? I mean, it's like everybody's into photography. I know some. Yeah, yeah, everybody's a photographer, but, but I, you know, the thing about text and image to me is that these stories somehow are important for so long, you know, we've all gone to shows at museums where there are amazing photos on the wall, and it, it's not as bad as it used to be, and then all it will tell you is, you know, New Orleans, 1954, that's it, right? 
And I'm like, God damn it, give me some more. You know, I've, I really started getting fairly angry about that. And, and the ultimate high modernist period, even that, you know, Detroit, you know, 64, would be around the corner. You know, there'd be no text, whatever. That, that was a, kind of the idea is that those photos somehow should tell the whole story. And it's, that's insane. That's actually insane. So anybody who's here who's producing images, I encourage you to add more layers, any kind of layers, you know? You can't, don't let them be these little impoverished <laughs> lone. As much as I love images, all right, so. This is the Santa Ana actually where the Night Watch uh, story is. So we can, I guess, hit the next one. So right there. Yeah. And he, I, I couldn't show him because he's working under the table for money. For <laughs> or food. He has food now. <laughs> Kids. Derek's the only one of us that never had kids. Derek had been out of work for a year, so he got this job guarding the construction site, and Trent got a job laying the concrete. So they're rebuilding a new sewer pipe under the river. It's exactly where Anne's across the river in 1772, and again in, wait, 1774 and 1776. Right, so the, this whole, the trail went to a place where the river narrows, and back then it was so deep and so wide and so fast that I went, it's exactly right there. Yeah. I went to the library, yeah. The there because it's the spot. And I went to the library to make sure I knew, that's the other part I love about this, is that we'll go there, but then I'll usually, especially with, An with, with um, Agua Mansa and with this one and with Eliza Tibbetts, I went to the Riverside Public Library and I found these great documents all the diaries that the people in Anza's party kept. So they crossed every river until they got to this one on foot. I mean, they crossed all the other ones. Uh, well, there was this one priest that insisted that the Indians carry him because he like didn't like to be in the water. And then there was this other guy that used to like to ride the horse, but everywhere else they crossed until they got to the Santa Ana. And what's weird is you see how small the river looks, right? because it's all been diverted upstream and a lot of it is reclaimed sewer water and you can walk right across it now, although as Derek says, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I let the dog go in there, but I still don't like going in there. I, I used to when I was a kid. The thing about the river is that back then they had to build a wooden, they had to go fell logs among the cottonwoods and build a bridge and they took over all the people, all the horses, all the cows, but two of the cows and one of the horses were so tired that they fell off and they drowned. They, they, they just, and so all of that was, was in our minds as I was writing, but we knew none of that when we showed up to do the thing. And as he's telling stories, oh, coyotes coming up. And, you know, there's coyotes cow, lining. Yeah. yeah, there are so many coyotes that come up. They can smell his lunch in the truck around, around midnight and they come up and hit the truck. They just bump it as if he's going to get intimidated and throw the sandwich out. I think it's really funny. Um, also, he's extremely bothered because there's one owl that sits on top of one crane, although now the crane is stolen, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, of stuff was stolen. Hundreds of but the owl sits on top of the crane, and, and the first few nights, Derek was telling us, the owl would drop rabbit heads right next to the truck. <laughs> and so Derek's like, yeah, I would look at the head, and I'm like, man, I'm not looking at that all night. So then I have to get out and pick up the head and put it in the trash can, and then the skunks come. <laughs> and we're just like, wow, yeah, these are long we evenings. These are long evenings for you, Derek. I'm glad I brought you a cake, because I did. I brought him a cake. And um, basically, the, the, the part about the stealing, 
He has to sit there for 12 hours because the economy is so bad. The day we were there, and then the day Dwayne and I went later, people are stealing everything. They're stealing the chain link. They're stealing the water, you know, the, the water truck. They steal cranes. They steal the outhouses. They steal the tools, yeah. everything. So yeah. some, yeah. The, the re before he was hired, there was a flatbed truck on the site, and they, they broke in, they loaded up the flatbed truck. And stole the flatbed. And stole the entire truck with all the tools right. on it. So again, Derek has a flashlight and a notepad and 380 pounds. So we didn't put his face in because, yeah. yeah. Oh, our dead sheep story. Yeah. This is a good question. How, how are we choosing the stories? Um, I mean, it's such an interesting array of stories, and, and a lot of them seem like things that are you know, familiar to you in some way, and then it's also a way of you exploring things that are maybe unfamiliar or that are, you know. There, there's a, there are multiple paths. There are multiple paths to that, and I think that one of them is Susan is just like a story collector, yeah. you know? So, story, so she just sits around and and so, and then every venture we set off on, another one just sort of happens along the way, or sometimes two. And at first we were making lists, so here's the ones we want to do, and now we're making lists of ones that we've already yeah, done. Layers of lists now. Right, right, we, they're already like in the can, but are like the timing's off, or we're not interested, or it's not quite finished, or something. I mean, we are so backlogged at this point. I mean, it's insane. There are so many stories. The bottom line is you can, you know, any, you just go anywhere. Just go anywhere. You, right. There's, there are so many stories. And okay, so everybody talks about the Trayvon Martin shooting and how that was a big story. One day, I told Doug before, this was before the Trayvon Martin, uh, I have 75 nieces and nephews. I have about 20 great nieces and nephews. You guys are like, wait. I thought you said you were like 50, you're like 80. No, I'm like 51. I have 20 great nieces and nephews. And um, so a bunch of my nephews have been shot at. And one of our young cousins was killed. Uh, March, it was like, no, it was like February 27th. He was a freshman, halfway through his freshman year with my daughter um, at, at the high school where Doug went. So he was shot in the head six times in his grandmother's driveway uh, for reasons which are still unknown because he was in the band. He, he's a black kid. He was in the band and he was in ROTC. I mean, you know, like 300 ROTC, ROTC kids came to his funeral. He had a mohawk with a blonde streak in it. That, that's not gang attire. He was borrowing a DVD and he was walking back to his grandma's house. Uh, two young Latino males pulled up in a car and one guy got out and shot him six times at close range. Three of the bullets went into his head and then the person got back in the car and drove away. No so the thing is, there are shrines all over Southern California. There are shrines all over America, right? Doug, Doug and I have not been able to write that story because it's not working out that way. But guess what? Somebody stole, somebody stole his picture out of his shrine last week. Really? They stole the picture out of the shrine and tagged the fence with more gang graffiti. And Doug didn't know that. And that's like, you can't, sometimes the story comes to us and we've gone out and we've done the photos and I can't write the story. I, I can't write the story. Doug has the photos and the other story that we haven't been able to do is, is the story of my, my mother-in-law's mom's house. Um, which is right down the street. That's Kansas, and the shooting happened on Georgia. So Doug, yeah, Doug took pictures of Dwayne and all the brothers and everybody once the house burned down. I can't write the post yet. It's just like that's not happening. But Doug has the pictures, so I have to say publicly that Doug has been really good. I'll say, can we go take pictures of that? And then he's got all the pictures. But it's me, it's me not being able to figure out the story yet. And if you guys are like, it's like a thousand word story, big deal. But that's why I think I like doing this because I put as much attention into that thousand words as anything I've ever written. You know, I want it to be perfect. We're, we're, trying to, we're taking this like quite seriously in the sense that, 
year, you know, maybe year after year, every two weeks after two weeks, it starts becoming a pointillist portrait of a place. And if you get enough, you know, you start adding them up and adding them up. It's a scatter. And I, I kind of love that idea that, you know, hit, 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 and pretty soon it starts forming this larger and larger and larger picture that you could never get if you set about trying to actually do that. You, this is the only way to get there. Is, and so then we're, we're attempting to spread out geographically and on subjects, and I mean, this is very roundabout ways to answer, but ultimately filling in little spots. The problem is you'd need like teams of people to really do this. Any place, any place is so interesting and complicated and you know, fascinating that if you just are out there, it, things happen, it just always well, is magic. Well, I wanted to ask you guys a question. So don't you miss story though? I mean, the LA Times, I have a piece coming out in the LA Times on Sunday up in the op-ed section, but. Everything's politics, you know? I mean, I'm sort of like, I, I'm very. Right, right, right. Meaningful stories that have, you know, some investment. Yeah. Well, there's story everywhere, but it's, you know, television. It's not our stories. Lord knows what story that is. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And it's, and what's, what's really great, yeah. has 1.5 million people and for whatever corporate decisions that were made I miss my newspaper a lot but I find that oh, I'm gonna get in trouble here there's just no stories anymore there aren't any stories like there used to be like even if you read Red Book back in the day there were great stories and Esquire had great stories and I mean I just loved reading and there were all these great essays I love the essays on the website I mean Don Waldy has his pieces twice a week um, Ed Fuentes, who it turns out is a Riverside Ramona Ram from 1977, he emailed me. Um, he's writing about downtown. Um, but I just, I love the historical stuff. I love being able to say to Doug, let's do this. So it's not just because Zach is here, because Zach knows I say this all the time. I really enjoy going to the site every day and, and looking, and I'm not trying to sell it either because it's not like we're making a lot of money. I'm just saying that I really miss that, don't you? I miss the local part. Absolutely, like the LA Times Magazine. It doesn't exist anymore in the same form. And the LA Times Magazine, I had an, a great editor named Martin J. Smith, 
And basically, he's one of the people that taught me how to write that 1,500 word essay. It's a really classic form, the 1,500 word essay. You know, think about it. It's a, it's a little longer than a post, but we used to have longer, you know, attention spans, like I said. I wrote about, <laughs> me, even me. If you forgot. Well, part of the reason I, <laughs> part of the reason I, I missed the LA Times Magazine is because Marty was so so generous in calling me and saying, do you have anything you want to write about in Riverside? And so I wrote about the car. I wrote about my chickens. I had chickens before it was cool. I had chickens when everybody was making fun of people who had chickens. <laughs> anyway, he but thought what, the what, chickens what, were what hilarious. It's not, it's not coverage or not. Yeah, I think. Or something. It's actually the story. You do have the coverage, though, and it's just the wealth that's yeah. given out today with the internet and everything else. Yeah. Right. So that's what. I think it's more like, yeah, the quirky stuff. I still think the LA Times does a great job, don't you? Say again. I said I think the LA Times does a great job. But I mean, I've only been in six months, so I can't talk about the Times to say, but I'm in general, like the local stories are out there. Yeah. And they're out there in actuality, arguably, in greater, you know, excess than they used to be. It's just, you know, you need to dig a little deeper. Because, you know, So we blame Google for what you're saying. Well, I think, but I think he's, he's exactly right for, and it's the same thing that Doug said in the beginning. There are more photos out there than ever, and there are more stories out there than ever. It's just, it's harder. I'm not going to say that everyone in Riverside doesn't have access to it, but it's true that there's this layer of people where I live that doesn't, that, that cannot figure out how to do that now. And they're missing story because we're used to having story in the newspaper. Like they wake up and every morning it's still the newspaper. And so you know what I keep thinking? We're going back to the old days when all the storytelling was kind of oral. So when somebody said, how do you guys come with the stories? I'll call Doug and I'll be like, man, so-and-so called me today and they told me, so I told Doug yesterday, so there's this guy raising buffalo right, right here. And Doug's like, what? Like who would raise? Yeah, right off the 60 freeway. So we're going to have to go look at the buffalo. And then I think a lot of times you're right. If you, if you know where to look, I actually love reading jacket copy, Carolyn Kellogg's thing in the LA Times about books. But I think what's missing sometimes is the stories about the places that aren't very exciting, maybe uh, not exciting, but it's not in the mainstream. And Riverside's always been kind of out there on the edge, and people always make fun of it. You know, when, whenever I was in LA, people would be like, oh my god, you're from Riverside, that's so cute. How long have you been there? And I'd be like, since my parents had sex. <laughs> like, and they're like, oh my god, you mean you're there like purposefully? Like, you mean you're, you're like, you like being there? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm there. I've always been there. And they're like, oh. And then they just look at me like they feel really sorry for me. So kind of like that looks, so you guys are like, yeah, it is really weird that you're still there and you're making fun of it. But yeah. Right, right. <laughs> We, we very, I think that's great. It's like we, we have had discussions early on and I think it just settled as like we, we basically decided maybe no one's paying attention, we don't really know, and we don't give a damn. We're just going to do what we want, you know? I mean, that's really in the end, of course, the only thing to do is sort of determinedly follow your own compass, the hell with competing with what, you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not going to change what I do at all to try and Korean audience. And in fact, if people really like stuff, then I'm fairly suspicious, you know. I've, I've, I've clearly got to try a lot harder. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's true. I say to Doug, the story's too sad or the story's too weird. And, and then he always says, look, don't you want to hear something? They herd sheep? Fantastic. Yeah, and they have, like, them. gleefully and herding them. sheep. And they just did their thing. Yeah, the kind of waves of sheep. They're young. They're yeah. young dogs. And the mom had already trained them. So, again, we didn't even see the big white dog until these guys were done. They moved 150 sheep 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. across a couple fields, through several gates, and into a pen, and, and the then the like. The owner, the ranch owner, guess what he was using? He had a plastic bag. Like, yeah. it's not like he had something you know, <laughs> He was like, he goes and he grabs his plastic bag and he starts waving it around, and the dogs are like, oh, we're doing that thing. And they're just like, let's go. And he's like waving the plastic bag. Yeah. He wasn't even waving a hat. You know, it was like a blue plastic bag. And then he was just looking at us. And then was Pretty low like, tech. And then he was She's like, been trying this with her students. It's not working. Like, oh, it's like. <laughs> road, and the sheep are going to run me over. Okay, so then I move over here. He's waving the plastic bag. He and the other two guys, they separated the sheep, remember, into like three different. Yeah. Just like that. The dogs finished, and they're like, oh, we're done now. They go over and they drink water and then they sat there and looked at us like. <laughs> it was just amazing. We felt they amazing. clearly enjoyed it though. I, know, I don't know. Like really... Doug so, and I were like, wow, we're not going to Yeah, I know. That's my click. That's my. Yeah. So there you go. There's some stories. <laughs> Isn't there one more? No, there's. Oh, there's yeah. a. See, I knew there was that one. That's the one that, that I was so sad about. That yeah. wasn't even the one the coyote got. That's just the one that it was really, really windy and cold the night before. Yeah. And, and, and he or she just didn't make it. See the sheep are moving down there? I'm on the other side of that group of sheep and Doug circled around and was on this side of the sheep. So he took that photo and I'm way over there on the other yeah. side down the road. And we, we sort of were circling the whole thing. That was a strange story, but it was really something. Again, we felt like we got really lucky just to see, just to see the, the way that the sheep still work. And, and those sheep have, that place has had sheep since I was three years old and, and went out there. I don't know. Thank you. I, I just, I, I always like to <laughs> I really like the question and answer part if anybody has any other questions though, because I always find that we talk about stuff that sometimes you guys aren't interested in at all. <laughs> None? Uh huh. in 1962 when I was about eight years old and I haven't had any interest in the in Inland Empire until I met Doug a few years ago and he told he would start telling me stories about no there's really interesting things out here and a lot of history a lot of culture and I've read every one of your your pieces and I, I, I absolutely love them and I like want to go to all these different places out to see some of this stuff but you know you're right. There, in people who live outside of Riverside, it's like, oh, you live in Riverside. There, there's so much out there, and the, the stories. You know, I, I, I don't. I'm not a sports person either. I'm legally blind. I can't play sports. I never went to sports. And that that piece on the game, it's like, I think I want to go to a local <laughs> basketball game. You know, one, one so thank quick, you. Quick Art an advantage in some ways to be in an edge or a marginal spot and clearly there's a sort of shadow penumbra and the you know the LA basin itself is this sort of but you know Kafka was on the edge of things you know I think there's clearer vision if you're not really embedded deeply in something because then you're just part of that what do you want? What you really want is to be sort of uncomfortably outside. Maybe not the easiest way to live, but probably the best way to live for art. So that's a, a quick comment. Yeah. kids and I have all my kids at my house right now 
before the unfortunate prom asking. There were like six <laughs> kids studying. I, I think all it really takes is to be a good listener. And this is the, oh, I'm so short. The sad thing is to tell my students, because they're not always good listeners, because they think the most important thing is the observing part. Seriously, Doug, ju Doug just cracks up. I can go to the post office and the clerk will tell me her life story. <laughs> Even though everybody wants to shoot me in the back of the head, she'll be like, well, my mom moved here from Cape Verde and you know, we spoke Portuguese. And I see that your daughter has that beautiful hair and it goes on forever, right? Everybody has a story to tell, but sometimes I think it's the way our faces look. So this sounds really dumb, but over all these years of my life, I would be the person, like when my brother-in-law would tell stories, we would be sitting in the driveway and everybody would be completely drunk. And my brother-in-law used to be a firefighter. He was the, one of the earliest black firefighters way up in California Department of Forestry. And he would say, when the fire's coming, rattlesnakes will come towards you and you have to chop their heads off with the Pulaski. And of course, everybody else is like, shut up, man. Nobody wants to hear that crap. And I'm like, really? What's a Pulaski? And he's like, well, it's this, like, it's a combination of a pig and a hoe, man. And then, like, a deer jumped over my head. And everyone's like, why don't you guys go, like, you're bothering, the Lakers are on. And so, he <laughs> like, go, and he would sh tell me what it's like when the deer jumps over his head. I'm like, we'll be close enough to where you could smell the deer. Everybody will tell you, if you just do that really stupid face, which I have, which the kids come home, they're like, and then we were on the playground, you can immediately be like, uh-huh, or you can go like, so what did you say then? Even if you're not listening, <laughs> you can say that. So I think I feel really lucky because wherever we go, you may go up to some total stranger and you're like, oh, you're sheep herding. And he's looking at us like, why are you here? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> we're trying to herd sheep here. But if you're me, you're just being like, so really, you live in that trailer? God, that must suck. Or you say something like that, and then everyone will tell you a story. And I think that's what I love so much. About I, it. I think we really yeah. enjoy honoring people with attention. And it's it's people. And it's fascinating. And it is. You're right. Nobody really cares about it, maybe except yeah. for us. So this has been a great joy and a pleasure for me because I've been writing about. I mean, I've written seven novels, and they're all set in a fictional Riverside. So every time I go to New York, people are like, again. So you're gonna write about like so they call for inland so they call it for you forever. They're like, don't you live near the beach? Don't you ever write about the ocean? And I'm like, it's Riverside. We don't have water. <laughs> I mean, we have a river, but it's like the same sewer water. And then they're just like looking at me like, okay. And they're like, so you're going to set all your novels in, in a place like Riverside. And I'm like, yeah. It's <laughs> just fail. And that's the thing is with Doug, I think that, like you said, it could be a valuable landscape, even if it's marginal. I'm 51. Now suddenly I'm like, wait, I like my marginal landscape. Like, that works out well for me. <laughs> and I think that Zach, again, like, Thanks, Zach. gave us that little opportunity and didn't ever say, this is really weird. I don't want to show a picture of a dead sheep. That seems alarming. Which I think any place else, we might send that picture and somebody might censor it. Or they might say, this doesn't seem very important. And Zach never said that. So, thanks. I'm going to write about my the mom's stupid